1 Kings chapter 18 is our scripture lesson. You've got your notes there. You've probably already turned there. 1 Kings chapter 18. I told you last week that I was tempted to entitle last week's sermon and this week's sermon, I've seen fire and I've seen rain, but I didn't want to pay royalties to James Taylor. Uh, but as I further studied this passage, it's really more accurate to have entitled it, I've seen fire and I've heard rain. Because when you really study this passage, it, it's a fascinating insight into praying. Let's look, starting at verse 41. Now, they've just had the big confrontation on Mount Carmel. Who, Whichever God, Baal or God, answers by fire will know he's the real God. And, of course, we know Baal doesn't answer at all. God sends the fire, and uh, the prophets of Baal are put to death. And then in verse 41, Elijah says to Ahab the king, Go eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. I think the King James says, the sound of an abundance of rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose and a heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off toward Jezreel about 14 miles away. The power of the Lord came on Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, I, I, I have to admit to you that I almost skipped these verses entirely. I almost just used them as kind of a postscript to last week's sermon. And then last week, as I was working on that sermon, it's like God said, you can't just throw these view verses in as a postscript because these verses are the culmination of the first three and a half years of Elijah's life. And they deserve your full attention. And, and so I, I, I slowed down and I dug into this passage. And hopefully uh, we found some truth that will be encouraging to each of us today. Now let me hearken you back to our theme verses from James chapter 5. We began our study looking at these verses in James chapter 5. In verse 16, the last part of that verse, James says, The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You probably have it memorized if you grew up in church. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. It's as though James is talking about prayer, and he says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, and the Holy Spirit brings Elijah to his mind. Here's an illustration of an effective prayer by a righteous person. He prayed, and it did not rain. Again he prayed, three and a half years later, and the rain came. Now, those weren't the only two prayers Elijah prayed in those three and a half years, but those prayers were the parentheses around that three and a half years of drought. He prayed, it did not rain. Again he prayed, and it rained. The first prayer is the beginning of chapter 17. The second prayer is our passage today at the end of chapter 18. I was not able to take this apart and outline it in a normal kind of outlining way. I just jotted down some lessons as I was working on this passage. So I think there may be eight of them. Uh, I think my, yes, my outline says V-I-I-I. -I -I. So I guess there are eight of them, if that's what V-I-I-I still means. And um, we'll talk about these together. The first one is this. Not all prayers are prayed the same way. 
If you look at verse 36, he's on Mount Carmel. They're having the challenge. He gives the prophet of Baal's first crack at it. You choose the animal you're going to sacrifice. You do your thing. We'll see if your God answers by prayer or by fire. And then I'll take my turn. And in verse 36, it just says, At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. And he prayed a prayer that, depending on your translation, is somewhere between 55 and maybe 70 words, in the mid-60s in most translations. Pretty simple prayer that he prays standing up. Now, you look at the prayer for rain in verse 42, Elijah goes to the top of the mountain, bends down to the ground, puts his face between his knees. Now, basically what's happening is, is he's kneeling, and then he's got his head bowed to the ground. So it's like his knees and his forehead are touching the ground. It was a posture that indicated intensity and urgency in his praying. But he's by himself now. The only other person that's with him is his servant. And, and I cannot, this is not in the Bible, but tradition says that this servant who's with Elijah is the son of the widow of Zarephath. Where you remember the, the son there who died and Elijah brought him back to life. Jewish tradition says that's who Elijah's servant was. It's kind of cool. But, you know, we can't prove that from the Bible, but I thought I'd throw it out because it interested me uh, when I discovered that. But here is Elijah alone in prayer. I mentioned to you last week that here you see an insight into the loneliness of a leader's prayer. You know, everybody else is gone. There's been a great victory for the God of Israel. He has answered by fire, but the work's not done yet. There's still more to do. And Elijah, as the leader, understood that the work's not over when the job's done. You know, there's, there's more to come. And he understood that, yes, and every leader understands this, it's important to celebrate success. But leaders know deeply and usually sooner than others that it comes a time when it's time to move on to what's next. You know, you can't celebrate forever something that happened yesterday when there's something waiting on you tomorrow. And Elijah kind of illustrates that as he is by himself in prayer. Not standing this time, but kneeling with his knees on the ground, with his forehead on the ground, symbolizing urgency, symbolizing intensity. Some prayers are prayed more intensely than others. Not all prayers are prayed the same. I think sometimes we wonder, well, if I'm not really intense and, and all worked up when I pray, does it count? Yes, not all prayers are prayed the same. And also, not all prayers are answered the same way. He prays for fire, and it comes immediately. He prays for rain, and it takes seven trips around the mountain before they even see the cloud the size of a man's hand. And as I was thinking about that, that not all prayers are answered the same way, two things, and, and I, I wish I could have been more eloquent at, at how to put these subpoints here, but the first thing that hit me is timing matters. All prayers aren't answered the same way. The prayer for fire, there was an urgency to that prayer. You know, God is on trial, if you will. The challenge has gone out. Here's Baal, here's God. The God who answers by fire will know he's the real God. The king is waiting on the response to Elijah's prayer. The prophets of Baal are waiting on Elijah's prayer. The prophets of Israel are waiting on Elijah's prayer. The people are waiting on Elijah's prayer. This is an unprecedented crisis in the history of the nation, and they're waiting for the answer. So there was an urgency about the prayer for fire. It wasn't like Elijah was going to be able to say, okay, Lord, you know, sometime in the next three or four weeks, if you ever get around to it, if you'd send fire, we'd be, because everybody would be gone home by then and nobody would have seen it. 
So there was an urgency. Timing matters. In the case of the rain, Elijah basically is by himself. Everybody else has gone home. And that hit me. Wouldn't you have thought that at least one person after the fire came would have gone to Elijah and said, you know, I haven't had crops in three and a half years. Could maybe we get some rain now? I mean, wouldn't you have thought that after they see God answer by fire, somebody would have said, could we please have rain? Because, I, I mean, I, again, I can't prove this to you biblically, but I'm not sure that Ahab kept quiet the fact that Elijah was the reason there was no rain. Elijah says to him in the beginning of our story, it's not going to rain again until I say so. I would imagine that every time somebody came to Ahab and said, okay, king, what you going to do? We need some rain. That he said, well, you need to go find Elijah because he's the one who said it's not going to rain. And, and I would have just thought that human nature being what it is, that after God answers by fire, somebody would have said, could we please have rain? Can I hang around here and pray with you, Elijah, so that we can have rain? Nobody does. And then it hit me. There was no urgency on their part for rain. Because for three and a half years, they hadn't had any. And they'd gotten accustomed to not having rain. And it is possible to get so accustomed to a bad situation that you accept it as normal. Be careful of that. You know, we're kind of in one of those situations right now. Don't accept it as normal. You know, keep trusting God, keep praying for a, a, a change, keep praying for some kind of a cure or something. Pray for something to change. Don't get so accustomed and so comfortable with no rain that it doesn't bother you that it's not raining. And you may know people in your life who have gotten so accustomed to a bad situation, to, you know, I, I, I mean, you, you can fill in the blanks for the people you know who are in a bad situation and won't do anything to get out of it because they've become comfortable with it and accustomed to it. Be careful. If you're in a less than optimal situation, be careful. Don't get comfortable. God wants you to experience rain. Don't get so comfortable with no rain that you don't even pray for rain. All right, so first, timing matters. And then second, and, and this is where I wish I could come up with a better statement, ordinary life matters. Here's what I mean by that. If, if I'd have prayed a prayer and fire came down from heaven, you know, with a 63 or whatever word prayer, and I prayed fire down from heaven, I'd be walking around doing that all the time. Okay, God, I need this, you know. I need you to fill up my gas tank right now. I need you to pay off this bill right now. I need you to do this, right? right? That's not how we live. Jesus didn't even live like that. He spent 40 years tempted or 40 days tempted in the wilderness by the devil. He, you know, he went through some of those periods of life. And ordinary life is not praying and fire comes down from heaven. Ordinary life is praying for rain and going and checking and there's no cloud. And praying again and going and checking and there's no cloud. And praying again and going and checking and there's no cloud. Ordinary life is being persistent in our praying and our faith in the midst of the mundane and the routine. When the cloud shows up, nobody is there shouting, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Because they've already gone back. And what, what hit me in this is how important it is to keep praying when there's no fire falling. Keep praying in the midst of the ordinary, mundane, routine things of life Ordinary life matters. And I wonder if one of the reasons why this second prayer, the prayer for rain, took so long to be answered is God was trying to tell us, sometimes I'm going to answer you immediately and spectacularly. 
Sometimes it's going to take a while. Keep praying. Don't lose your faith while you're waiting on the cloud. Lesson number three. Repentance is a prerequisite to answered prayer. The fire came before the rain. Now, something I keep going back, and I'll probably repeat myself two or three times here this morning on this. Elijah had a promise from God in the first verse of chapter 18. You go show yourself to Ahab, I'm going to send rain. But repentance had to precede the blessing of the rain. Fire in the Bible always symbolizes cleansing or purifying. The nation of Israel had to turn back to God first before the rain would come. Fire always comes before the rain. Repentance always comes before the blessing. And that's true in our lives. Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity or cherish iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. Not always, but sometimes the reason our prayer is not answered is because we're holding on to some sin that God wants to, us to do away with and we're holding on to it. And we're treasuring, cherishing that iniquity in our hearts. So please remember, it's true nationally. You're hearing a lot of people quoting, you know, the Second Chronicles passage. If my people, then I will hear. Repentance comes before the rain. And in our individual lives, the same thing is true. But Elijah had a promise from God. God said to him, go show yourself to Ahab. I'm going to send the rain. He is praying for something that God has already told him was going to happen. Which leads to the next point, which is pray the promises. When God gives you promises, pray the promises. Now, there's a whole lot about prayer I don't understand. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot about prayer you don't understand. I think prayer is one of those spiritual disciplines where the differences between us humans and God is really in stark contrast. Because we feel like, well, if, if, I, if I've got a promise, then God's going to do it. Well, then why do I need to pray if he's already said he's going to do it? And, you know, with us, it's an either or kind of situation. God sees it as both and. Yes, I've promised it, but you keep praying. I do not understand it. I have given up trying to explain it. All I know is it's the teaching of Scripture. So do it. You know, you, If you have a promise from God, that doesn't mean you stop praying about the situation. Elijah could have just said, okay, well, we're done at Mount Carmel. The fire's come down. God said he was going to send rain after I ran into Ahab. I've run into Ahab, so I guess it's going to rain now. Let's go home. But he didn't. He prays. Pray the promises. Do you have some promises from God? Sure you do. <laughs> you have a Bible filled with the promises of God. Do you pray them? Do you pray the promises? You may have a promise for a specific situation you're praying about. God has given you a promise. You pray that promise. But we've all got the promise when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. You been praying that recently? Lord, it seems like the enemy is coming in like a flood. Lord, the water's rising. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a flood. You promised, God, your words, not mine, you promised you would raise up a standard against the enemy. I need you to do that in my life. We need you to do that in our nation. We need you to raise up a standard. God, you said, your promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lord, I feel alone. I feel forsaken. I need you to reveal yourself to me so that I know the truth of that promise 
that you'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. If you will add some of the promises into your praying, I think you'll find your faith being built, and I think you'll find your prayer life taking on a deeper meaning as you pray the promises. And you pray them with persistence. This poor servant, you know, I hope he was the widow of Zarephath's son because he was probably just a, a late teenager and he had enough energy to run around that mountain seven times. But here's what's going on. King James says, go again. Six times, go back. Go back. Anything? No, see nothing. Go back. See, here's the situation. Mount Carmel is located to where one side of it you can overlook the Mediterranean Sea. Apparently, Elijah is on the back side of Mount Carmel. And so he's praying for rain, and he knows, you know, whatever that system is, that the rain is going to come up out of the sea, and the water is going to do whatever it does, and the clouds are going to come up out of the sea. And so he sends the servant, go around the mountain, see if there's anything coming up out of the sea yet. Nothing yet. Go again. Elijah's on his knees with his head pressed to the ground, praying for rain. The promise that he already had, praying for rain. See anything yet? Not yet. Go back. <laughs> See anything yet? Not yet. Go back seven times. We, we're not told how long that process took, but it wasn't a matter of just a few minutes. It was a while. And he kept looking for the answer. How many times in our lives do we stop looking for the answer just before it's going to come? If he'd have stopped at visit six, he'd have never seen the cloud. Are you sure that's true, preacher? Yeah. You remember what Jesus said? You know the verse. Ask and it'll be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it'll be opened to you. What you may not know unless you've heard me preach on this passage, or someone else, is that in the language that Jesus spoke, the verb tense of ask and seek and knock can be translated ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Did you ever go visit somebody that you hoped wasn't home? And you kind of, real soft, two knocks, Oh, well, nobody's there and kind of left, you know. Now, this is not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about banging on the door till somebody answers. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. It is the fervent prayer of a righteous person that accomplishes much. It is the persistence in praying that says, God said he was going to send rain. Go back again and look for a cloud. And when he saw just the size of a man's hand, he says, okay, you better tell Ahab, get out of here, because he's getting ready to get flooded out, and his chariot's going to get stuck in the mud. He needs to get home. Because I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And that's the next lesson. Before the rain comes the sound of the rain. This has been rumbling around in my spirit and I have not been able to get hold of it with my mind the way that I want to. So I pray that God gets it into your spirit, whether it gets into your mind or not, it gets into your spirit. That we know in the natural world, that's often true. You hear the building of the wind. You hear the thunder in the distance. Sometimes you can hear the rain getting closer. Before the rain comes the sound of the rain. The same thing is true in the spiritual world. You hear the sound before the rain comes. And it hit me. When does Elijah say, I hear the sound in an abundance of rain? Not after the seventh time when there's the cloud. He says it before he even begins to pray. In verse 41, 
he says there's the sound of a heavy rain. And then he starts to pray. I think what it was in his life is that he had that promise. You go present yourself to Ahab, I'm going to send rain. Now, he didn't know the time frame. He didn't know how long after he saw Ahab the rain was going to come. But he seemed to have an idea that the rain was somehow connected with his meeting Ahab. And that promise was all that he needed to know that rain was coming. After three and a half years of not a cloud in the sky, not a drip of drizzle, without anything for three and a half years, he said, God has told me I'm going to send the rain. And I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Because his senses were tuned in to God's promise. And because his spiritual senses were tuned in to God's promise, he could hear the sound before the promise was fulfilled. Do you hear the sound? Say, well, well how do I get my spiritual senses tuned into God's voice? You expose yourself to God's voice. What is this called? God's word. You know, get in the word. Read the scripture. Saturate yourself with scripture. Hear the word. Get accustomed to his voice so you hear the sound before the rain even comes. The sound of the supernatural answer. These verses are not in your notes, but if you're taking notes, jot down Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, and Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Habakkuk, just abbreviated H-A-B, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, speaking of the vision God gave the prophet, he says, though it tarries, wait for it, it will surely come. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, if God said it, he will do it. If he's spoken it, he'll bring it to pass. Elijah had the promise. You go present yourself to Ahab, I'm going to send rain. And finally, the seventh time, the servant comes and he says, there's a cloud, it's about the size of a man's hand. That's not a very big cloud. After three and a half years, that's not going to hold much rain. But that's all Elijah needed to know. And he sends word to Ahab, Rain is coming. You better get home. Then it starts to get serious. In verse 45, the sky grows black with clouds. The wind rose. A heavy rain started falling. Those are frightening times. If you've ever been in the middle of a serious storm, those are frightening times. Dark skies, heavy clouds, heavy wind, heavy rain. But I want to make a spiritual lesson to you. If you're in one of those storms right now, <laughs> the skies are darkening, the wind is howling, I want to encourage you to get excited because it means rain is coming. Do you hear the sound of the rain? God's promise is getting ready to be fulfilled. And I have not been able to get away from this Ever since I've been working on these verses, it's a word for somebody, I don't know who, but somebody's been praying for a long time. And God's getting ready to answer your prayer. And I just want you to tune in to the sound. Do you hear the sound of supernatural provision? The sound of a supernatural answer? The sound of the barriers being broken down and God's work being set free? God's promise is being fulfilled for somebody. Do you hear the sound? Because before the rain comes the sound of the rain. Tune in to God's voice. Let your faith rise up and hear the sound. But you've got to prepare for the results of the rain. <laughs> I heard about a community that was filled with farmers and they were experiencing a drought and the local community church announced a prayer meeting praying for rain and the people gathered from all over that community to that little church to pray for rain the preacher stood up 
looked over the crowd, and he said, you're dismissed, go on home. There's not going to be a prayer meeting tonight. Said, what do you mean? This was specifically announced that we would be praying for rain. Not one of you brought an umbrella. So apparently, you don't have faith that it's going to rain. So you just might as well go home. <laughs> if you're going to pray for rain, pack an umbrella. Prepare for the results of the rain. Our passage in James 5, it rained and the earth produced its crops. And Elijah said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. When God sends the rain, it's going to be enough. And when the rain comes, the earth produces its crops. When the rain comes, you have harvest. But if during that three and a half year period of time, you've not had a harvest, it's not rained, your barns have started falling apart, there's holes in the roof, the siding's coming off, you haven't repaired anything. Where are you going to put the harvest when it comes? If you're going to pray for rain, prepare for the results of the rain. That's just a challenge. You know, prepare for the results of what we're praying for. Stop and think about what you're praying for and what it would look like if God answered that prayer. And then ask yourself, am I ready for that? Am I prepared for that? I learned this lesson earlier in my ministry. One of the churches I was pastoring, we were seeing explosive growth and explosive growth of new Christians. And we kept praying for that. Then all of a sudden, I stopped praying for that and started praying, God, would you please send us some mature Christians? <laughs> would you please send us some people that have been in leadership, some people that know the word, some people that can help us? as we train these brand new believers? You know, we, we were praying, but we weren't quite prepared for the results of the prayer. And in, in your life, are you prepared for what you're praying for? If God answered your prayer, could you handle it? And, and, and I really wonder, and I've, I've mentioned this before, I really wonder if this period of time that we're in this coronavirus pandemic, this is the first Sunday of August 2020 when I'm preaching this live. But I'm wondering if this time isn't intended to be a time of preparation. Now I know that there are a lot of business leaders who are having lots of discussions about what their business model is going to be after all the restrictions are lifted. And I've heard of business people saying, you know, I'm paying an awful lot of overhead renting office space and leasing office space and all the overhead for that. And I'm 100% working from home right now, and we haven't missed a beat. I wonder if we ever going to go back to an office. You know, there's, there's a lot of those kinds of discussions happening of what are we going to do next? What's the next thing look like? And I want to encourage you. Now, I, again, I realize that many of us um, haven't missed a day. You know, we, we've still been, uh, you know, we, we discovered that it's not necessarily cool to be essential, you know, but, but, you know, we haven't missed much, but there are some people who've had a lot of downtime during this time. And I wonder what we're doing to prepare ourselves for the rain. Are you learning a new skill? Are you developing the skills you've already got? Are you broadening your knowledge of your field? Are you developing more self-motivation and self-discipline? Are you deepening your walk with God? Are you allowing the fruit of the Spirit to grow and mature in your life? Are you developing leadership skills? Because it's interesting that in verse 46, and when the rain started, Elijah tucks his robe up in his belt and takes off running and runs faster than Ahab does and gets to Jezreel before Ahab does. I heard one preacher say, when the rain comes, believers need to be in the forefront. Believers don't need to be trailing behind. When God sends the answer, it's time for believers to step up and take the lead. I think that's a pretty good uh, application of that truth right there. But what I want to ask you today is, do you hear the sound? When you're crying out to God in desperation, 
That's the sound. When, when your spirit is crying out, God, nothing but you will do. That's the sound. When you're praying the promises, that's the sound. And I believe that if we'll tune our spiritual ears to hear God's voice, we will begin to hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And if you're in a dry period of your life and you're crying out to God for relief, I just want to encourage you, tune your ears to the heavenlies and hear the sound of an abundance of rain. The old gospel song put it this way, There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. There shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing. Now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. And Lord, we do plead for the showers of blessing. We plead for the showers of blessing in our own individual lives. Lord, I know there are so many people that hear this sermon every week, whether here in the building or online later, that are going through challenging times, and they need the rain. They need the showers of blessing. And I pray that they would begin to hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Lord, we cry out for our nation that we would hear the sound of an abundance of rain, that you would pour out your blessing on us, and that believers will be prepared to step up and take the lead when the rain starts to come. Lord, help us to evaluate our state of readiness for the rain. And if there are some things that we need to do in our lives, maybe the fire needs to fall and purify us of some things before we can experience the rain. Or maybe we need to develop some other things so that we're equipped to handle the results of the rain. Lord, prepare us, I pray. We're waiting for those showers of blessings. In Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today.